welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education meeting. Tonight is Thursday, June 15th. Can I have the attendance, please? Mrs. Bealy? Here. Mrs. Leifert? Here. Mrs. Massenville? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Mrs. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Mrs. Starr? Here. Mrs. Cobb? Here. Mr. Vashon? Can you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of I know we have um, many adjustments to the agenda. Okay. Yes. Um, so the adjustments to the agenda tonight are in addition of the first readings of policies JICK, JICKR, JICKE1, JICKE2, JICKE3, JICKE4, and a student safety plan. These are all model policies from the Department of Education that were updated in 2016 around bullying and cyberbullying. Um, and then we also have the removal of two appointments, the 6-8 Improvement Specialist and the 9-12 Improvement Specialist. Um, I'm asking to remove these from the agenda tonight in light of the failed budget vote um, as we're working to analyze our next steps. Okay. And also we'll have a brief budget update. As well. Yes, and we're going to provide a, a brief budget update. Okay. So that takes us right to 5.0 recognition. So I would like Ann Cass to come up to the podium, I guess. Yes. Um, I just want to say a few words about Ann and take this moment to recognize her since she was unavailable to join us at our um, district wide rec uh, celebration last meeting. So. It is with great sadness, but also great pleasure for Anne that I share with you her plan to retire at the end of this school year. Though Anne has only been with Scarborough Public School since October 2006, 2013, she has a lengthy and impressive history in the field of education that spans over four decades, if my math is correct. <laughs> as soon as she earned her bachelor's degree in English from Colby College, then her uh, then her master's degree also in English from Middlebury College. She began teaching English in 1973 that sound right? and continued teaching until she became a director of studies in Manchester, New Hampshire. She then continued in leadership roles for a number of years and in a number of states including Oregon and Connecticut until we were fortunate enough to have her on board as an acting principal at Blue Point School in 2013. She continued in that role for two years and is currently an assistant principal at Blue Point in Pleasant Hill and this year has really done a remarkable job stepping up and filling in um, when one of our colleagues was unable to be with us. Um, those schools might sound little, but keep in mind they're in two different parts of our big huge town, our 55 square mile town, um, and it doesn't really matter the size of the school, a school needs a principal. And that is something that I know Anne is really passionate about, and she made that crystal clear to me the day I met her. <laughs> um, <laughs> during her time at our primary school, she's demonstrated leadership, um, curriculum, and leadership and curriculum, communications, collaboration, and problem solving. She is the chief note taker for every single one of our leadership meetings, and we all so appreciate her detailed and thorough notes. Um, I don't know who's going to fill those shoes, but. Um, I'm taking a, I'm taking a application. <laughs> <laughs> she also um, has a great ability to manage the day-to-day -day operations in the schools and making sure that not only do the students feel safe, but also the staff feel safe and supported. So though I've only been able to work with Anne for a short time, I can tell you that she's been a great asset to not only our primary schools, but to our whole leadership team and our staff. She'll be deeply missed. But I wish Anne um, and her husband the very best as they head into their next phases of their lives. Probably need to wish my husband better luck. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually coming to work for us. No, <laughs> <laughs> we just made a deal. <laughs> Thank you. I have not very many words, but as you know, I always have words. <laughs> so it's been a great run. I've really enjoyed working with the people with whom I have worked. I've enjoyed learning what it means to work with five, six, and seven.
16-year-olds, which is very different from working with 16, 17, and 18-year-olds. The adults are pretty much the same, the goods and the bads and the confusions, but it's, it's been a great fun, and I'm, it's time to stop, but I'm not, people keep saying, are you counting the days, and I'm really not, because I'm too busy to count the days. <laughs> I hope to stay connected to the district and to many of the people that I've worked with, and I really, I've learned a lot. I think I've been able to contribute some things, and it, it's been fun and I'll make it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. you are ready this evening. <laughs> <laughs> to say too that I have been incredibly impressed by you. 
I think, you know, I, I don't know what your life was before coming to our town, but if, if, it, if there's any chance you moved around at all, I would think that it's really reflected in your flexibility and your ability to adjust so quickly. Just the thinking that you just presented about what am I going to do, how am I going to get involved, you know, because coming into a high school in a new school setting, that is pretty darn tough. People have built their friendships and their little groups that they're attracted to, and it's very hard to break in. So, but I think you have just been so impressive. I will, I will just never forget your work last year, particularly when we were talking about the gender issue. And your presence uh, here and in front of students uh, is exemplary, and you have set, I think, a wonderful example for other students to follow. And your presence on the stage is captivating. <laughs> it's absolutely captivating, and I appreciate it, and thank you. Thank you for all of your efforts there. And I wish you just the very best as you move forward. And you can still see her this summer at Ace Hardware. <laughs>
So for a motion, if everyone else is fine with it, I will accept a motion for all of them together so we don't need to individually. Mm. Including the flow chart, yes? Yes. Okay. And so explain Second. Does so that explain part of it or is she on separate? Okay. Yeah. Also, also including the sacred plan. Oh, okay. Okay. So we have a second. Jackie? Yes. I have a question. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, actually, it's a request. It, it's sometime by October, our October meeting next fall, that, that we might get a report on whether or not we've had any serious incidences. I don't want to enumerate it or just what is our experience, I guess, so far. Mm -hmm. Yes, that can happen. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Oh, Jeff, 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 Jeff. No. Okay. All in favor? First reading? Seven. Thank you. That takes us down to um, 6.10 appointments. So um, 6.10.1. The uh, Wentworth School Special Education Teacher. Here. Sorry, I advanced your agenda you a lot right. by putting all those right. together. Okay. Um, the Wentworth Special Education Teacher, Whitney Nathan, has been selected to fill this position created by one year leave of absence. Ms. Nathan attended Skidmore College where she earned her Bachelor's of Arts degree, Vanderbilt University where she earned her Master's of Education, and Brandom University where she earned her Master's of Arts degree in Special Education. She has taught school in she has taught in schools in California and Tennessee, and most recently was a long-term special education consulting substitute teacher at our Wentworth School here in Scarborough. Ms. Nathan will be placed on step eight of the Masters Plus 30 scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Whitney Nathan as the Wentworth special education teacher as a one-year position. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? Okay, all in favor? Seven, thank you. 6.10.2, Wentworth School Art Teacher. Abigail uh, Wilworth has been nominated to fill this position created by a retirement. Ms. Wilworth earned her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the New Hampshire Institute of Art. She has worked in several school districts in the area, including Portland, Biddeford, Cape Elizabeth, and most recently as a long-term substitute at both Pleasant Hill and Wentworth School. Ms. Wilworth will be placed on step one of the bachelor of the bachelor scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint um, Abigail Wilworth as the Wentworth School art teacher. So moved. Second. Any comments? All in favor? Seven. Thank you. Um, 6.10.3, middle school special education teacher. Ashley Fasulo has been selected to fill this position created by a retirement. Mrs. Fasulo attended Union College in New York where she earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology and Salem State College where she earned her Master's degree in Special Education. Mrs. Fasulo has been a Special <coughs> Education teacher in Massachusetts since 2009 and is also a New Scarborough resident. Mrs. Fasula will be placed on step 13 of the master scale per the collective bargaining agreement, and the recommendation is to appoint Ms. Ashley, Mrs. Ashley Fasula as the middle school special education teacher. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Seven. And then 6.10.4, middle school band teacher. <coughs> Melissa Shabo has been nominated to fill this position created by a resignation retirement. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Shabo earned both her bachelor's and master's degree in music education from the University of Southern Maine. She's been a band director for over nine years in many neighboring districts, including Mount Era Middle School, Shakopee Valley Middle School, and most recently Bonnie Eagle Middle School. Ms. Shabo will be placed on step 11 of the master's scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Mel Melissa Shabo as the middle school band teacher. Mm -hmm. Second. All in favor? Seven. Thank you. And that takes us to 6.11, a brief budget update. <coughs> so as you're
Mr. Superintendent, I feel it's my responsibility to provide you with data, the data you need to make decisions on behalf of our school district. Obviously, the results of Tuesday's budget referendum were disappointing, but it's clear that we have more work to do in order to meet the needs of all of our community members. School and town leaders have already started um, discussions about next steps. And although this is just a preliminary discussion, I want to make it clear that we understand further cuts to the school expenditure budget will most likely be necessary. We've already begun to reevaluate and analyze potential changes to the rejected budget proposal. It will be my recommendation to the board and the town council that we reduce our operating budget in order to reach our goal of 3% for an estimated property tax increase. This will honor the goal set by the town council at the start of the budget development process and will hopefully allow for our community members to support the budget and move forward together. As we know, there's a chance that we may receive some more funding for education from the state and we hope to have the actual numbers um, possibly by the end of this week. I heard a rumor, but hopefully by the middle of next week. And the town council has already passed a budget order stating that any additional funding over the amount of the budget that we would potentially receive would be used half to reduce taxes in FY18 and half to increase fund balance for future school years. Um, if we're able to make the, the cuts to get us to the 3%, I would ask that we amend that recommendation to allow for 100% of any additional funding to be received as excess revenue and applied to fund balance to support the FY19 budget because although this has been a tough budget cycle, um, we can look forward and, predi and predict that it's going to be even more challenging in FY19. And so um, through the curtailment and the hope and possibility of any additional state funding, we would want to be able to be as prepared as we can for that. I feel it's important for me to reassure our students and our parents that while we will make recommendations to reduce the budget, our leadership is being thoughtful and careful and we're thinking about um, all of the risks and the, the potential effects of the decisions that we make. Um, and we are going to make decisions that have the least impact on our students. It's not our intent to pull emotional strings um, in order to rally folks out. Our, our hope is that our community will be paying attention and understanding that we're working really, really hard to give the smartest possible budget that we can. Um, and we really need their support to make sure that what we, uh, what we do present um, is supported. So as we continue to this process, through this process, I'll share um, more specific details about our recommendations. Uh, we're not ready yet to share those because we're thinking about in, in about a thousand different directions and really trying to analyze every single corner of the, of the budget that we have already put together. Um, I plan to meet with our full leadership council next Thursday on the 22nd after school is out to solidify our proposals, but I did want to share my thinking with you tonight um, and give you an opportunity to begin to consider some of my recommendations, but also to start, um, you know, rallying the troops and getting people ready to come out and vote in support of our schools. <coughs> Jody, do you have anything you want to add? Sure. Um, I, too, am extremely disappointed. I think that goes probably without saying. Um, but I think I also, while I respect what Superintendent Cooperger is saying, I think we need to be um, very careful before we start um, throwing numbers out there and, and things out there. It's, it's two days after the vote and, and as the superintendent has said, I think we're going in a million different directions and, and looking at a lot of different ways um, to get this budget passed. And I think we need that time without it being um, critiqued less than 48 hours later. So um, I appreciate and I know that the superintendent and the leadership are working hard to find cut what those cuts may be and, and to the extent we, we just don't know yet, it's, it's early and we need to do that thoughtfully and strategically and um, I like to hear that we're not, we're trying to make cuts that may be the least impact on the students. I think that's important but I also think it's important for supporters and, and parents to understand that they still will be felt. Although it's not a big giant seventh grade sports emotional um, cut. These are, are things that are really important in moving our district forward and to not be able to implement them just 
slows the process down for our students um, to continue to move ahead. I, I have full confidence that we're still moving ahead and moving forward, but it's just not um, at the rate that I think we should be doing it. And I feel like we say that every year. It's a little slower and a little slower every year. Um, the budget failed by 600 votes. It's a huge margin. And so I encourage um, the folks that have emailed us this week in support of um, the schools and um, I encourage them to find friends and neighbors and start talking and getting the facts out and making sure that people understand what the real impact of this school budget is and not what um, rumors are and what people are trying to say out there that just frankly can, can be a little misleading. So I encourage them to get the facts. I, if, if you're looking or have questions, ask the superintendent, email, call, right, do whatever, um, or the town manager, ask a school board member or a town counselor. We have the facts and are willing to express them to you, and I encourage you to do that before making a vote based on hearsay or someone else's perception. Um, again, thank you to those that supported the budget. I think it was a great budget. It was, um, it was strong. It was thoughtful. It was, it was making the right choices for our students, and it's unfortunate that it didn't pass. Thank you. Is anyone else? Donna? I do, but Jackie had oh, a hand up Jackie. before me. I have a question. Uh, probably Kate Fulton, our finance director, would have to answer this. But what would the increase have been in the school budget had we received the $1.4 million from the state that was reduced this year? Well, I can't answer that off the top of my head, Jackie, but um, the, I can say that the increase in the expenditure portion of the school budget, which was the piece that we really had the most control over, was at 3.38% when we put it out for votes. Um, with the change in valuation and no change in, or no loss of revenues, we probably would have been looking at a school tax request of something in that same range. Um, so you know, looking at perhaps a 4% increase on taxes before you add in valuation and before you get to the bottom line, which would have put us well under 3% for a town tax increase. So it was most definitely the loss of outside revenues that created the need to ask for more tax dollars, as you know. and. Um, I think that the, the, the difficulty is that we have no control over that piece, and I think that the message that, that we've been hearing is that we could have taken more control over the spending side because that was all we had to work with. Thank you. I think it's also important to note that in looking at the past five or six budgets, oh, um, our estimated expenditures in, in the budget that was proposed and put to the voters was significantly lower than any budget that has been um, put before the voters in the past five or six years. We were, our expenditures were, as Kate said, 3.38 or 9 percent. Um, I think last year it was like five and a half percent. I would just like to let the public know, I, I've been involved with schools for a number of years. And when I was first on the school board, the state paid for buses, 100 percent. They paid for special education, 100%. We now have the buses in our budget. We pay for all of the buses. Special education funding is at whatever our subsidy is. For the last five years, uh, we are now paying as a community uh, the full retirement benefit for our teachers. And that bothers me because the state law says that education is a function of the state and that school boards are elected to carry out that function. We have lost over $5 million in state subsidy in the last five years. It is very difficult for me 
to look people in the eye, and especially our youngsters, and say, we can't do this anymore because the state wants to take our money to do other things. I applaud the superintendent and the finance committee. I applaud the town council, uh, town council's finance <coughs> committee for coming together to try and support the town, not just the schools, the town. It's a town budget, and I thank them wholeheartedly. And it, whatever we do to reduce this budget and bring it back to the voters, no matter how hard we try, it is going to have an effect on our children. Um, so, I've lived in the town for 36 years, and I've watched the, the town councils turn over, school boards turn over, and watched my kids go through the school system, and I have been so impressed by the collaboration between the council and the school board the past couple of years. And I think this year really was the ultimate, in that we really truly came together and attempted to strategize and collaborate in creating a plan that made sense and was a reasonable request from our citizens in terms of tax, taxes for the school. It's unfortunate that a sign went up in this town that misled people. I think that was a huge impact. That that sound sign let people think that it was a 7.4 tax increase. And and that is as a result of a group in town who do not want any tax increase. I feel that they want no taxes attributed to the school. They want to roll back what we have in the school system already two years ago. When you lose a couple of students or you have a small decrease and you think, look at the impact, when you're talking about a few kids, one grade here, different grade there, it doesn't reduce the numbers of teachers you're going to need. Um, there's, n there's been no excess spending in this budget. When I sat with principals for the past several years and heard them ask for nothing, no, nothing, I'm astounded. As a principal every year, there were things I felt I needed to have at my school so that the next year around, we could do things a little different. We could add an ed tech, or we, maybe we need to buy a set of books that would support our kids in a particular um, classroom, a particular grade level, a need, uh, some special ed needs that were coming along. And, and every, every year, I hear nothing. I'm, I'm astounded. And, and unfortunately, that's where we're at now because of the shift in the, the money to the town, the loss of $1.4 million to our district is a huge impact. And our legislators tell us what? We are property rich and we can afford it. And you know, I've been in direct conversations now, being on the board for the past several years. I have directly called people during the winter and spring months to have those conversations. Written on um, the uh, Scarborough School Board webpage, seen the kinds of questions that come up there. Some people would be shocked to see what is, can be written on those pages. It's, it's very upsetting at times. But, um, you know, I, ju I just think I see no fluff here. The only asks have been in special ed, which we have no choice about. We have to fund that special ed. And in a few requests at the high school where we really need to do the kind of work, the kind of trans transformative changes that take some money and some people to support the work. And so, you know, excess funding, spending, not there. No, are we a business? No, nope, we're not a business. We don't have all these revenues coming in. We can't put out requests for money. 
We don't put out uh, proposals to businesses to support our schools financially. I, you know, I look at rural towns around who are offering foreign languages at the lowest grade level. Chinese is going to be offered in, in Bonnie Eagle to the, the lowest level kids. Some towns more rural than us have had foreign languages for years in the kindergarten. We can't even begin to think about possibly having our, our youngest kids have foreign languages. That sickens me. So, you know, I just i am I'm terribly upset over this. I'm um, really pleased to see the kind of work that we've done with the council. I, I can't see how we can make reductions now without impacting our kids. It, it's going to have to impact the students. And, the parents, I'm sure the parents will be turning out in the next few weeks. I would imagine, I hope they were paying attention because this is going to mean an impact. And, you know, hopefully things will change in the state and we'll get a little bit more, get a little bit more funding and maybe we can work something out regarding that. But I hate to see, to see it way, the way it turned out this past few days and I'm, I'm just so worked up over it. I, you know, as you can tell, and I just, I just feel it's, it's terribly unfair in that um, the community needs to wake up. This is a town with lots of educated people. Education matters. Your vote has to matter. Your time to vote has to matter. So that's the other concern I have is the voter apathy. So, anyway. Well, you know. There's not much more to be said. It's incredibly disappointing that we are in the position we're in. Um, you know, I was looking at the Press Herald article that had all the surrounding towns and their voter turnouts. South Portland had like 800 voters. Portland, we had more voters in Portland. Scarborough, for the size of the community we are, we do have pretty good voter turnout for a non-November ballot, comparatively. Um, just a matter of getting the correct information out. And that's a budget that we have nothing to be ashamed of. That I'm incredibly proud of the work that the Finance Committee did, work with the Town Council and the Town Manager to get a budget that was um, within the goals of the Council for an acceptable, predictable tax increase. And um, it's unfortunate that there was um, communication otherwise from other people about what the true tax impact would be. Um, hopefully we can come up with some stuff that won't be um, noticeably and immediately detrimental, and perhaps we can get some additional funding from the state that can replace some of those programs in the next budget year. But, you know, we're hoping for a better result next time and spread the word with the, with the facts. That's all we can do. Um, okay, so that takes us to 7.0 of the workshop. 7.1, Superintendent Annual Evaluation. Perfect. I don't think there's a microphone hooked up there, so you might need to take that one from the table and drag it over if it will reach. I don't know. I just want to make sure it's going to get picked up. So you may remember in the fall when I um, came to you and presented my um, three goals for this year. I um, generated those goals <coughs> utilizing a tool that has been used in the district by our leadership um, a, for a couple of years now, and it's based on Marzano's 21 leadership qualities, so we have boiled it down to a core 10. Um, I utilized that um, as a survey. I surveyed our leadership council and the school board and asked them, although you haven't known me, known me for very long, please um, rate my leadership on these core 10 responsibilities. And then from there, I um, reflected on what I thought my goals needed to be as your superintendent, took that feedback, and made some adjustments. And so I did a full presentation on that back in the fall. And today, I just wanted the chance to come back to you and tell you how I'm progressing towards my goals and also model for our leadership a new tool that I developed for them to use in reflecting on their own professional practice goals this year. 
So I think that as the superintendent, it's really important for me to model what I expect our leadership to do um, in terms of setting goals and reflecting on their goals so that they can model that for their, their teachers and then the teachers can model that for their students. Um, this fractal nature of our schools is, is so important for us to be aware of and um, I try to embed it into my practice regularly. So uh, this, as I was preparing on my reflection for these goals, I also tried to incorporate some of the proficiency-based education components that again, we're expecting of students. I think that if we want students to be able to rate themselves and then teachers be able to rate them, that I should be able to do the same with you, my teachers, the school board. Um, and what I have here is um, the beginning works of my reflection on my goals this year. They're not, um, this is not completely finalized. My intent is to start the conversation tonight. We'll then go into executive session and talk about it further. And then Kelly, as the school board chair, will give me some feedback and rate me in these areas as well. So I had three goals this year. One was around communication. One was about building relationships. And the third was around situational awareness. And again, that came from the feedback that I, the baseline assessment that I conducted in the fall with input from our leadership council and the school board. So the way this template works, um, and you know, we're all testing this out, and I thought, again, if I want leadership to use this tool, then I need to use the tool as well. Um, I'm liking it so far. Uh, what you have first is the actual goal, just copy and pasted from what I shared with you in the fall, and the beginnings of some of the strategic actions that I started to take this year. And then we have a scale that looks exactly like the scale, or very similar to the scale that our students will be using as a transition to a proficiency-based rating system. Um, the difference, the only difference here is that their scale, their uh, will say exceeds the standard or learning goal, meets the standard or learning goal. Um, and since I'm not using standards for this, I'm using that, those core 10 responsibilities, I tweaked it a little bit. Um, but it's a four-point scale similar to what they would use. On the left side is my self-rating after I analyze the data that I've collected so far from the Leadership Council and the school board. And then on the right is where I'll ask our school board chair, um, Kelly Murphy, to rate me um, with feedback from the board. So um, after the rating section, there's a little reflection part and then a place for me to collect evidence um, that supports that rating that I'm sharing with you. And so I'll go over these three goals with you. And again, know that I'm going to um, continue to do a deeper reflection on this. It's been a little bit of a busy week, so I didn't get as much time <laughs> on my re written reflection piece, but know that I um, have it all in here. So uh, based on the baseline data, I set a goal for myself to increase my communication ratings um, to be 78 proficient or higher and 78 proficient and 22% distinguished as measured by the core 10 responsibilities. Um, and when I look at my goals, some of the strategic actions that I took in order to reach this goal was developing a comprehensive communication plan. Um, that's still a work in progress. What we're really trying to do is um, embed all of, create a matrix that will allow us to track across multiple forms of media who we're communicating with, when and why. So that if we see a gap, for example, if we're overly using social media but we're not using printed communication, um, that will bring my awareness to that and we can make some improvements um, in that way. One of the things that I have done, um, and I didn't have a chance to link all the resources in, but was create a, a calendar for our, all of our leadership council meetings and it also includes school board meetings and school board workshops. And so for each date that you see on that calendar, the agenda is linked right there in that spot. So um, I'm not logged into my computer or else I'd be able to pull these things up easily for you. But um, that, again, was an attempt to increase communication. And you remember me talking about Anne Cass, Anne Cass's lovely note-taking skills. All of those notes from our meetings are linked into the agendas as well. And all of the resources that we use during that meeting are linked into the agenda. Um, and so that's, a, a, to me, one of the uh, an attempt at really trying to increase communication with the Leadership Council, which is just one small aspect of our community. So when I look at the ratings um, for this goal, uh, I had 91.7% 91 of the respondents to date, and I've only had 12 responses so far, but I just sent it out yesterday, so 
I'm happy with that rate and or that rate of response. And I will adjust this as more response com responses come in. Um, so 91.7 percent of the respondents of the leadership council and school board members who rated me to date rated me either proficient or distinguished. And 8.3 percent, which equals one respondent, rated me basic in this area. Um, and that's really helpful feedback because that helps me think about where do I need to continue to grow. And so um, being basic in this area means that I maintain open lines of communication with others, but I have not yet cultivated an environment that fosters open communication um, with and among others um, so that discussions of concerns or explanations of significant decisions can be considered. Um, and so that's an area that I'm going to work to improve, I think, um, in terms of the audience who's responding to this. For our leadership council, our agendas are so jam-packed and sometimes we think something's going to take, well, that'll just be 20 minutes. I just have a quick update and it turns into 50 minutes. So it does leave our meeting sometimes feeling rushed. Um, and only even the fact that one respondent rated, rated me basic and the other ratings are proficient or higher, that still, to me, is helpful feedback. And I'm trying to think about how can I use that feedback to make this 100% proficient or higher. So although I've met this goal, um, I don't give myself the highest rating because I do think that there's still improvement to be made. Some of the evidence um, that I was mentioning earlier, I started a new television show this year, so if you haven't seen it yet. Um, we filmed three episodes, and that's really with partnership of Eric Huntington, one of our high school teachers, as my videographer <coughs> and producer. Um, the first episode featured the Wentworth School, and we really highlighted the benefits of the community partnerships that exist in Scarborough. Um, the second episode was about the budget process, wanting to create open communication for folks to be able to better understand the level of um, in-depth analysis and strategic thinking and planning that goes into that. And the third episode um, was celebrating our PLT sharing day and really helping the community understand why professional development or how professional development leads to improved student outcomes. But the whole premise of the show um, is to can make more connections with our community, to increase um, communication, and to also break down the four walls of the school for folks in our community who might not get a chance to be in the schools as much as we do. I also maintain um, two social media profiles, one on Twitter and one on Facebook. Um, and so I've been trying to use that, again, to give out just-in-time communication, but also um, quick, fun updates about what's going on in our schools, but also an opportunity to educate the community and share things that align to my core values as your superintendent around education. So sometimes you'll notice that I'll tweet an image or a quote or an article that reinforces what I think is important in the work that we do. Um, so it's a good way for the community to get a better understanding of my perspective and my thinking and my philosophies around teaching and learning. Face-to-face -face communications with various communities, community organizations and individuals. Um, I've tried to any keep my door as open as possible. Um, my schedule is not as open, but um, I appreciate the folks who reach out to me and are flexible in their scheduling so that we can get together, whether it's to have a coffee um, or to visit a school or to come to a club um, a social club in Scarborough like Kiwanis or Rotary or um, participating in the alumni golf tournament, really just trying to get out there and be visible um, and be an active member <coughs> in our community. So I've done a lot of face-to-face -face work this year as well. Um, print media, we've had articles, tons of articles in the Scarborough League. I'm trying to quantify that, but I don't even read, I probably see them all, so um, I don't know the exact number. Um, we've also had articles in the Forecaster and the Portland Press Herald. I've done two television interviews um, with local news channels this year and also um, had some, a feature section in the K2 newsletter and the high school um, student newspaper. Through electronic media, trying to communicate through the, um, the school board newsletter and being able to provide information and support to um, enhance that great communication that our school board does, and then also the town newsletter. We're trying to get on a regular schedule so that there's always um, something about the schools in there, and there's actually two great stories in the new town newsletter that just came out today about our Wentworth Garden project and our um, teen cooking kitchen at, at the high school. So if you haven't seen it yet, um, take a look at that. 
one of my goals, you know, has been to have 100 school visits, authentic school visits in 177 days, and I'm on track to meet that so long as there's um, <laughs> nothing on my calendar for the next couple of days. I think I'm up to like 97 or 96 visits, so I have a couple more to get in, but I have some dates with our K-2 um, students and their learning fairs coming up, so I'm looking forward to that. And this isn't just me stepping in a school or like, you know, walking by a school, counting that as a site visit. Um, I'm in the schools a lot, meeting with other folks, meeting with staff, um, meeting with principals, but also hosting community meetings. I don't count those in the 100 visits. These, um, the 100 visits are when I'm engaging with, with teachers in their classrooms and students in their learning environment. Those are the, those are the events that I've been counting, um, or the visits that I've been counting. And then I've also been trying to attend um, you know, multiple other events that happen outside of school hours. Um, so obviously this, this month it's been easy with all of the senior events and the great athletic events happening right here on our campus, like the lacrosse games and the softball games. Um, but then also going to the concerts and um, being present for some of the other um, activities that celebrate our students outside of, of athletics. But just being engaged and again, seeing students in different elements and seeing staff in different elements outside of their classroom has really helped me have um, maximize those chance encounters when I bump into somebody and they say, hey, let me ask you a quick question, or do you mind doing a second for me to show you something? I feel like that really goes a long way, um, so I try to make that a priority when I have those opportunities. doesn't necessarily help me with my um, time management, but I think that the, the return on that <laughs> investment is well worth it. And then, um, of course, attending staff meetings. The principals have created some opportunities for me to be able to address their whole faculty at their monthly building meetings, um, whether it was talking about start times or um, I actually was able to facilitate a staff meeting at Wentworth this year, so that was a, a great way, again, for me to see staff in a different way. Um, and I have plans and ideas um, for how I could maybe have more opportunities like that. But sometimes I also like to go to staff meetings just to sit in the back and take it all in like a staff member as well. And I been able to do that at the middle school and high school this year. So that's my first goal, communication. Um, my second goal was about relationships. And so um, once I'm finished finish fully reflecting on this and writing, I'll fix it so it's not um, all chopped up like this. But this, for this goal, I, I know that relationships are important. I think that um, everything that we do relies on relationships. I spent a lot of time thinking about the budget vote and um, wondering if I had stronger relationships with key influences, influencers in our community, if the outcome could have been different. Um, and I believe that the answer to that is yes. I set this goal really high. I wanted to have 100%, I wanted to be 100% proficient or better um, in this goal as measured by that rubric that I've been talking about. Um, and part of that, again, those school visits overarch into this. The one-on-one -on -one monthly site visits that I schedule with our principals, I think, adds to that because building relationships with our school folks is, you know, the heart and the, the heart of the work that I need to do first and build those relationships while also trying to build relationships with our community members um, and our and the folks who work on the town side as well. So having those monthly visits, I try to make them walking, talking visits with our principals, but it seems that this year a lot of times they ended up just being like, what's on your list, what's on my list? Um, and I hope that as we be, get to know each other more and as we build stronger relationships um, and better channels for communication in our leadership meetings that we really will be able to be walking the halls and in classrooms together. The times when I was able to do that, it was really beneficial. And I think it's a really powerful message for students and teachers to see um, me with the principals in their, in their space as well. I also have regular weekly meetings with Monique and Joanne. Um, we meet, we try to meet every single Monday. Um, and there's several other, other staff members that I meet with regularly. Allison and I started getting a regular meeting on the calendar so that I could just be supporting her best and learning about her work um, and the challenges that she's facing, but also celebrating some of the really great things that are happening at, um, in our special services work as well. Um, I also um, am working on building relationships outside of our community, which obviously isn't reflected here in this feedback that I've collected from the Leadership Council and School Board, but really connecting with other superintendents 
Um, that's a big part of my job as well. And getting up to Augusta and making connections, um, building a relationship with our commissioner, I think that that has been a successful thing that has happened this year. Again, not going to be reflected in the school, but um, he, he gave me a call the other day when he found the day after our budget vote didn't pass and said, what can I do to help? Do you need me to come down? Um, and so we're, we have a meeting scheduled for Tuesday, and I thought that was really great of him to make that, to reach out um, and make that connection with me, and I look forward to his support. Um, also, as we're kind of analyzing our strategy and looking at, okay, what, you know, is, is our school spending totally out of whack? What happened in other towns that, um, whose budgets were able to pass the other day, um, especially those who were able to pass by large margins? So I was able to last night at about 11.30 send out a Google form to superintendents in our area, and by 8 o'clock this morning, 12 of them had responded to my questions that I had about what, you know, what was your um, net expenditure, what was your gross expenditure, what was your overall estimated tax rate, what strategies worked, <laughs> like what, was your, what were your strategies. And so to get that kind of response quickly um, just reinforces how important relationships are. So in analyzing the data, you can see here that I've partially met this goal. Um, I'm demonstrating a partial understanding of the goal. I think I have a full understanding of it. It's just putting that understanding into action. Um, and so when I was analyzing the 12 respondents that I have to date, 83.3% of the Leadership Council and School Board members who were able to rate me um, in this area rated my ability to build and maintain relationships as proficient. Um, so six said I was proficient, and of that 83.3%, another four said that I was distinguished in that area. Two respondents rated me as basic, which turns out to be 16.7%. Um, so that's why it says not yet, that I have not yet met this goal, because remember, my expectation for myself in this goal was 100% proficient or higher. So here I have some more work to do. Um, and that basic rating says that um, my current relationship building skills um, are sensitive to personal aspects of others, but that I'm still having difficulty in developing a greater awareness of personal issues and critical events that may impact job performance or health. And um, again, I think that um, I've done some things in this area, but definitely can improve. So. What I have done this year was actually facilitated discussions with our leadership care or our leadership council about self-care. Again, something that's really easy to talk about and not as easy to put in practice. And this is where I'm also trying to model um, for our leadership and our staff. And um, I try to limit the, the amount, besides Joanne, so limit the amount of late night phone calls <laughs> um, and emails. I've actually been utilizing this kind of connection to communication, but trying to utilize that boomerang um, feature on Google Mail so that I can send it any time. <laughs> I can schedule it to send at like 8 in the morning so people um, aren't receiving emails late at night. Um, if it's really important, I like to schedule it so it gets there nice and early. Um, but I've been trying to use that feature because I don't want leadership to think my expectation is that they're up at 8, 9, 10, 11, whatever other time at night. Um, answering my emails because I certainly don't, I don't think that that's healthy for us. Also, at, at even at opening day when I was still um, crispy and new, I was reminding our teachers of how important self-care is and how important it is that we take care of each other. Still more work to do with that. Um, and having these conversations too with our K2 staff at their PLT kickoff day, um, we talked a lot about um, how fast things are changing in education. and how quickly we need to change, but that we really need to create social networks of support for each other so that we can um, remind each other when you need to take a break. And I can say to Barb, all right, you need to go home like you've been here all day long. Um, tonight, I said to one of our principals, nope, my, I don't expect you to come tonight. I need you to go home and take care of yourself. And so having that, again, communications, relationships, all builds into this, right? They're all interconnected. Um, I tried. Um, using activators at the beginning of our leadership council meetings and spent um, a several sessions in a row asking us to reflect on different aspects of gratitude in our lives, um, things that make us happy, taking a moment just to pause before we dig into the deep work that we need to do to reflect on those things because I think that all plays into to the wellness and um, 
in supporting our staff and building those relationships. Already, our leadership council knows that my expectation for them next year is that they're going to have a minimum of one professional practice goal um, that they'll focus on, and it'll be a specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time-bound goal like I'm modeling here. But then I also have required them to come up with one wellness goal that will also be specific and measurable and attainable and realistic and time-bound. And my hope is that we'll have a level of trust and comfort with one another that we'll be able to share those goals with each other so that we can hold ourselves accountable for taking care of ourselves. Because if we're not healthy and we're not happy, then we're not going to be the most effective leaders that we need to be. And again, my, my hope is that if I'm modeling it for our, leaders, our leadership council, that they're modeling it for the teachers who are modeling it for their students. Um, and it's kind of coming up the other way, too, because we have lots of teachers who are um, studying mindfulness and growth mindset and working with their students on how to manage stress, both healthy stress and unhealthy stress and anxiety and all of those other things that impact our performance. So still more work to do on that goal, but I feel good about the fact that some folks are recognizing my effort in this area um, and appreciate the feedback of where I need to go. All right, so my third and final goal is about situational awareness. And so this goal, I um, had said that I would like to uh, I would like to be at 78% proficient and 22% distinguished as measured by the core 10 responsibilities. Again, that's 100% proficient or higher. Notice that I'm setting the bar really, really high for myself because I truly believe that if we set goals here and we come here, then that's still that's good news. But if we set goals here just because we know we can meet or exceed those goals, that's when we're going to fall flat and we're going to become stagnant in our growth. And so um, setting that bar high for, high for myself, and I have not yet met that goal, but I'm making some progress towards that goal. So you see my rating there again, three meets the goal. Um, I'm not quite there. But the data today shows that 75% of the respondents rated my um, oh, that should say situational awareness as proficient or higher. Um, and this is one of the goals that I wasn't setting for myself in the beginning, if you remember. Um, I was thinking more about visibility than situational awareness. And of course, again, there's overlap between those two. Um, but eight, eight of the respondents said that I was proficient in, in this area, and one said that I was distinguished, while well, three respondents, which is 25%, rated my situational awareness as not yet having cultivated methods that identify the undercurrents that can be indicative of significant problems. Um, and so I have, uh, I have actually spent a lot of time and effort in trying to notice this um, in, in our staff and the way we interact and work with each other, but clearly an area for further growth. Some evidence of effectiveness here is um, when I do sense that there is an issue or know that there is an issue, scheduling meetings with staff to be able to sit down and address it right away and have those tough conversations rather than letting it linger on um, or just um, letting it go by without having that attention that it needs. Um, that's something that I've been trying to do. Somebody comes to me and says, I want to talk to you about something, um, and it involves another staff member, I try to say, let's get together with that person and have that conversation together because I don't want to be um, modeling or supporting a culture where, you know, you can say it to me, but you won't say it to the person who you have a concern with. Um, and so those are not easy conversations to have, but they're important conversations for us to have. And it's my job as the superintendent to be aware of, of those undercurrents. Um, I also schedule monthly meetings with our teachers union, the SBA. Um, and again, same idea. I want to get feedback. I want to get input. They're on the ground. They're in the trenches, so to speak. Um, and so I really value those times to get a pulse of what th how they're perceiving the work that we're doing, but also what they're hearing from colleagues. Um, and oftentimes I take that back to leadership and say, here's what I'm hearing. Um, the question always is, is it one, is it some, is it a ton um, of staff who are saying those things? And we're working on um, <coughs> developing a culture climate survey so we can get some baseline data to really better understand where is our staff in terms of feeling supported um, and feeling empowered and job satisfaction and um, how, do, how do they feel that we're doing in terms of our communication with them. 
and we're scheduling that to happen in October. So I think that's going to be really helpful for us to be able to use in our, our as a district, goal setting and reflection um, as we look into the 18-19 school year. So although we're just ending 16-17, we're already thinking forward, you know, to 18-19 um, and 17-18, obviously. I really do try to maintain open communication with staff, parents, and students, um, taking time to hear their concerns. Uh, I feel strongly that I'd rather you tell it to me um, than tell it to someone else if, it, if there's something that I need to be doing about it or there's something that I can, um, some way I can better support you. One of the things I try to do is really be clear with whoever I'm listening to is, do you want me just to listen? You just need me to be aware. Do you need me to do something about it, um, or do you need, you know, me to connect you to some sort of, sort of supports and resources? Because I've found that oftentimes people just want to tell me, um, and so that that's hard for me to do because I'm a fixer, um, <laughs> and so I always want to do something about it. But um, I'm, you know, really practicing my listening skills in those in those scenarios, and. I find that sometimes people just need to know they can get it off their chest, and it's my hope that as I'm building trust and as I'm developing relationships, um, that more of our staff and our students and our parents uh, will feel comfortable having those really um, vulnerable conversations with me, but then also that they'll be clear with me. When do you want me to get in the mix, and when do you just want me to listen? Because I think that's really important. So I started to capture some of the professional development that I've been doing. Um, as everyone in here knows, I am a doctoral student, so I'm not short on professional learning. Um, there's plenty of that going on. And I really do think that although um, I'm very busy most of the time, whether it's here in school or in my uh, doctoral work, I think that being a doctoral student is one of the best things for a new superintendent. Um, I'm constantly reading. I'm constantly engaged in conversations around best practices and um, reflecting on my own learning. And um, so this, the courses that I am taking through Boston College have been immensely helpful in the work that I'm doing. I also took, um, as part of my certification, an online, an online course for Maine and federal law, which has been really helpful um, in bringing my awareness to uh, a deeper analysis of our policies as I'm new to Maine. I think that the timing of that was also really great for a new superintendent. And you know what they say, busy people, get it done, right? So I'm, <laughs> the busier you are, the better, I think. Um, and then I've attended some other workshops. I attended a workshop um, put on by MSMA about the ED279, so really understanding the EPS formula and how our budgets are developed here in Maine. Um, I've also been trying to attend some networking events, so I went to a great networking event out at St. Joe's called Meet Your Future Maine. Um, and I was able to connect with local businesses in the area, um, but also better understand some of the options that our students have. And then books, I've read a lot of books this year. I captured on this list um, the books that we've read together as a leadership council. If you can believe it, we've had three book studies this year as a leadership council. I think that's pretty fantastic. Um, we read one together, school board and leadership council, and that's a practice that I would hope that we would continue. Um, I think it really helps to be able to have common, um, common experience, common learning experiences that can ground our work, but also help us keep our values in check and, and, check and balance. And of course, um, tons of reading and learning about uh, proficiency-based education. And then another thing I'm starting to capture here is just different leadership development. So um, some things that maybe have allowed me to test my leadership abilities or expand my leadership abilities beyond just my day-to-day -day superintendent work. Um, and so we've started a PDE committee this year, which has been really great. So initially I was facilitating that and then realized I should pass it off to the experts. Um, so Monique and Catherine Ruby have been facilitating that um, throughout, and I've been able to just be a participant in that, which I really appreciate being able to learn alongside our, our um, teachers and leaders. Recently I started a school start time implementation planning committee Again, that is um, a, a community outreach piece. We're trying to engage um, people from our community with varying uh, views on the start time issue to be a part of the transition plan. And so we're starting to just get into the work now that we've established some common, some norms.
times and some ground rules, um, we're starting to brainstorm some tools and solutions that we can come up with our, for our families. So that's been a really great experience, and I'm co-facilitating that with one of our teachers. Um, Mary Record is a health teacher at the high school, and so I think that's a, a unique dynamic as well, to be able to build capacity of our teachers and bring them into some leadership roles in that way. And then um, the other thing that I'm really proud of and plan to continue into next year is the Equity Improvement Network. This is where we um, brought together some social workers and guidance counselors and leaders in the district to unpack our transgender student policy. And um, students have also been involved in this work. We really wanted to best, better understand that policy and think about, you know, what, is it really, what does this policy really mean? Because anyone can enact a policy. That's the easy part, right? Well, sort of easy for <laughs> people on policy are like, it's not that easy. Um, but enacting it is one piece of it. We then have to really collaborate around the implementation aspect of it to make sure that it actually then has influence on um, the work that we do in our schools. And so we used a plan, do, study, act, improvement cycle to analyze um, the policy, but then also to think about what were our next steps. And initially we went into this work thinking that we needed to create a template for a safety plan for students. And using some of these improvement strategies, we, um, we used we did it like a fishbone diagram in three small groups and really trying to get at like, well, what's the real issue? What's the real aim? What are we really trying to accomplish with this policy? And rather than saying like, oh yeah, we need a template so that students, you know, the principals can use this as students to help them feel safe, that's important work and it needs to be done. But what that group came up with was that, no, we really need to do some work to ensure that all students feel safe in our schools. Um, and after we came up with that common aim in three separate groups, it really was quite amazing um, to see the way we got to that. We then said, okay, so what is it going to take to get to this goal? And then we started brainstorming some different strategies. And so one of the things that was on that list was um, more learning opportunities for teachers and for leaders. Uh, we need some professional development in this area because um, there's often times when, when we might see something or hear something, but we don't quite have the tools or know yet how to facilitate an intervention or a conversation. And so some of that work is going to start with um, the, the professional development that Leadership Council will be engaging in on June 28th and 29th, which is about cultural proficiency. And so I do believe that in order for us to really truly create safe schools for students, we need to understand our own identity and our own implicit biases and how that influences our decision maker making as leaders so that we can then bring that down to our teachers and to our students. And so those two full days of professional learning are going to be really important to kind of get that up and going and started. Um, and then we'll bring the group back together next year to talk about what are some of the plans. So those are, that's my beginning of my reflection. I started to think about um, what will my goals be for next year, and I started with my wellness goal based on some of the feedback that I got in the survey response. Um, and so I think I'm looking at, I already try to get at least eight hours of sleep, but I'm realizing how important sleep is. And so um, on nights when I don't get eight hours of sleep, like last night, I feel like I'm not as clear, I'm not as sharp, I'm not as <coughs> Sleep is going to be one of my goals, and then I plan on measuring that and tracking that using a bedtime application that I've played with a little bit. Um, you put in your bed, you know, your, your bedtime and your wake time. Um, maybe I'll get fancy and get a Fitbit. I don't know, but um, I'm collecting some baseline data now so that that way I can really see like, well, how much sleep do I typically get? Because I've been using that but not really monitoring the data. And what I say about data, what's measured needs to get managed. So. Collecting it doesn't really mean anything if I don't use it. So that's where I am right now with my goal setting. I have not set a professional practice goal. I've been thinking about it, but I really wanted feedback from the school board. Um, and I'm happy to share my full results of the core 10 feedback. I only chose to highlight the areas that pertain to my three goals here. So thank you for listening. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And while we're making a transition, I want to give kudos to our doctoral student, Julie Kuchenberger. She today was in Boston at BC defending her dissertation topic and was approved. So this has been, when she says a busy week, like she means it's been a busy <laughs> week. <laughs> so. One step closer. We're very proud. Thank you.
Child Left Behind to Every Student Succeeds Act. Yeah. Take a bit of your time to talk about the differences um, between um, No Child Left Behind and the new um, Every Student Succeeds Act. But also, I'm going to be seeking public input and looking to invite the community um, to be involved in helping us craft our plan moving forward as well. In short, uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act is the major federal law that governs education from the federal level. It really has two prongs to it. It governs certainly the state and local accountability requirements for K-12, but also the federal entitlement funding programs as well. So you may recall No Child Left Behind, which was um, enacted in 2002, had some big pieces to it. One was the state testing. Uh, and the standards, establishing the state standards, but then there was this thing called adequate yearly progress, which was um, determined <coughs> between the state and the federal level, and then there was this whole component around highly qualified teachers, and then certainly a number of reporting requirements as well. Well, with this reauthorization, um, now called Every Student Succeeds Act, um, it does have the same policy goals as No Child Left Behind, around improving the equity of access of education for all students, um, the improved outcomes for students, strong state and local accountability systems, the state testing is not going away, the participation rates are not going away, um, but it also policy-wise um, in includes um, taking a look at underperforming schools and providing support, as well as assisting students with evidence-based interventions. Some of the significant differences is that this new federal law is much less prescriptive. There's a great, great more deal of flexibility with that, but it also highlights certain areas needing increased attention, particularly in um, well-grounded education and this area of evidence-based intervention. So with this increased flexibility, it's a wonderful thing, but it also increases responsibility as well. So states have greater flexibility in the areas around their accountability systems, so the state will put together its plan. They have a comprehensive improvement plan, um, and they have a little bit more flexibility in those accountability measures. Uh, they have some flexibility in those targets they choose to set. Maine has set a target for the year 2030 for 90% of Maine students to be considered to be college and career ready. Um, but and also a bit of flexibility in selecting strategies for those interventions great deal more flexibility, actually. But on the other hand, we have greater responsibility <coughs> um, in involving stakeholders in every part of the improvement process. Uh, we also have this requirement um, around improvement planning. So in the past, when I would do the application for the funding for No Child Left Behind, the federal goals were there, and so our project just needed to meet those goals. So it was literally a checkoff box. Now, each district needs to have an improvement plan process aligned to Chapter 125, need to articulate that process, the goals we've set for ourselves, and our strategies in meeting those goals. <coughs> we need to do that for the district, and we need to do that for every single school in the application process. Uh, and so as a result of that, it also will require additional reporting on those pieces uh, and additional subgroup reporting as well. The funding that is delivered through these title programs um, for our district, while well, there are five titles here, uh, our district receives funding for Title I and Title II. Uh, and Title II, so uh, what I'll do is I'll share how we spent the money in the past and then talk about our thinking for the future. Uh, we have just heard just last week that our, for fiscal year, um, 2018, our allocation will be $143,000, 845. 
Um, in the past, we have spent this on salaries and benefits and some others. Other is really professional development and supplies. And Title I, um, which is focused on um, helping struggling students in the area of math and in the area of reading. This funding typically goes to Eight Corners School, and Eight Corners continues to qualify um, to be eligible for Title I funding. And so we are looking at, um, in the for next year's grant application is to continue along those lines. Now there is significantly less money than in previous years, um, and that's a result of the combination that the state is receiving less and our free and reduced lunch numbers have declined a little bit. Title 2A is the 2A focus for this title, is <coughs> improving teacher quality. There's a little bit more flexibility in 2A in terms of how we spend the money. We can also put spend the money on um, supporting uh, teacher leadership and school leadership. So at past couple of years, we spent this money on salaries and benefits to support the instructional coach model at middle school and high school. The other was spent on um, professional development. Uh, and so, uh, we did not purchase any supplies with this over the past few years. Uh, there is an increase in this funding, significant increase, because the new federal legislation took away one of the um, requirements around holding harmless, and what that did was it kicked us back to 2003 numbers. So for this next year, it, <coughs> we get an increase as a result of that, pulling that hold harmless. Uh, in the um, president budget moving forward, they have completely zeroed out all the Title II funds. That is their proposal, so we may not receive any funds next year, depending on where the federal budget falls. So as I described before, for Title I, we're looking to maximize the funding um, to continue providing support to those students at Eight Corner School, and for Title IIA, to continue to fund the portion of the high school coach position, and then to allocate the balance to help support professional development, particularly in the area of teacher and school leaders, to continue to develop that um, to continue the work in the schools. Mm -hmm. And if um, there is anyone in the public uh, or board members here, anyone here in the room who would like to be involved or have any questions or comments, please be in touch with me. I have a deadline for um, submitting an application of July 1st uh, or, and for substantial approval and then a final deadline um, both for our report and our application for next year of August 1st. So please be in touch with me if you'd like to be involved in the process or if you have any comments about um, how we plan to spend the funds this year. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. I have one. Perhaps I misunderstood what you said. Did you say that the state was not required until 2030, as in 2030, to meet the mandate? Or did I misunderstand? No, uh, the, the, goal. Uh, the title. Mission. Goal? Oh, 2030. Yeah, 2030. 2030. It's a, a long-range plan, long-range strategic plan on the part of the state. And okay. the, that's what I thought you said. Yep. And I was thinking 2030, 90% of the main students. Okay. And and throughout that year. That's only 13 years. Uh, right, right. But through the next 13 years, generation. we well okay. know how we'll things move. work here in the state. It will probably change okay. into other things. Every Do we know what the percentage is right now? I mean. It's of uh, our students that are college and career ready? No, I mean, of our students, that would be great to know, but of the state, I mean, the state has set the goal of 90% in a generation from now. I'm just wondering how far we need to travel as a state to get there. So the yeah. indicators that they're going to be using to measure, they're just starting to craft. The, um, in part because of a new administration in Washington, we still don't, the state still does not have um, formal approval of the entire plan. Uh, so that is a work in progress, um, we've, and these numbers may well shift a bit in terms of our allocation. One more question. Are sure. states sharing their plans? I mean, everybody with each other? To, yeah, everybody has to read. Yeah. It seems like every time something yeah. changes, yeah. we try to have the, the plan that Maine has is actually um, based on last year at the superintendent's, was it the commissioner's conference or mm -hmm. the superintendent's conference? Um, we had an outside presenter come from Chicago who shared um, uh, goodness, everything, I can't think of everything good. His plan, Perfect. yeah. <laughs> they sh he shared his plan. He used to be the former president of AASA, which is a, a, a national organization for school leaders. 
but that is the basic shell of what became our recommendation, fully endorsed by the superintendents, and then they took that and did work around that to get to the plan that Monique okay. is talking about. So we are definitely trying to lean on each other right. and mm -hmm. use okay. proven tools for Thanks. that. <coughs> well, any questions? I just, well, when you talked about the long-range planning and that the state and local have the you know, responsibility for improvement planning, is that what you're, and I know you said the July 1st deadline, is that, mm. Mm. does that have to do with that or is that more beyond the July 1st? Well, I'm going to use deadline? the framework of the 24-month improvement plan and those goals and strategies mm -hmm. and the work that's been done in the past. Um, but the um, state fully understands in the meetings I've been attending that many school districts may be in transition. Um, the state is, um, is plans to provide a framework and some support mechanisms and some templates for school districts to use um, to craft their plans um, moving forward. Uh, so it, for the grant application process, I just need to report on what our current process has been. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for explaining the change. The only thing I would point out is that you may have noticed more work, less money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I could pretty much do this application in about three or four days, including the report, and this year it will probably take well over a week, just in terms of the information that, and the pieces that need to be put into place. Well, in progress. Yeah. I just received uh, my copy of the main educator this week and it indicates that uh, the proficiency based education that most school districts, according to the MEA, are not really even on the start. Yeah. You know, there was this nice the three days of articles in the newspaper. Yeah. But the MEA is saying that Many, many school districts haven't even started. So well, I that, would just note that, that tells that. me that moving forward, something else is going to change yeah. because then the state isn't going to be ready. Yeah, yeah well, you know. I think money has yeah. yeah. to add to that. Um, so the um, state has been um, surveys the districts every year. So the state may have different data sets um, than that data set um, because in my conversations with our area districts, people are in lots of different places along the way, and it is a transition and will take some time, but there are certain steps that districts are taking and moving forward. And as we know from our workshop about proficiency-based education, Scarborough is very far along, um, yes. and I don't know how we compare it to other people. It doesn't really matter, but we are on the right path, and our students are going to be hit the ground running with it and our staff in the fall. So. I mean, there are some questions, obviously, that still need to be worked out this summer, but um, that's all happening really soon. But we're in a good we're in a good place for I'm that. Very proud of the work we're doing and have been doing, and will continue to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That takes us to um, 8.0 motion to go into executive session pursuant to one MRSA 40560 for the purpose of discussing the Scarborough Educational Support Professionals contract not to return to public session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Seven, thank you. We have the new vote. Don't we go?